So living problems at 14. Uh, what I wanted to do was, I, I guess it's kind of, so if you want something that is written, I think what I'm saying, sorry, this wasn't planned at all. Um, I think what I'm saying is that if you read uh, section 9.4, then it'll cover some of the written content that uh, you will see me talk about. Uh, although, I don't know, um, I guess, sorry, the reason I'm surprised that this is the place where your textbook brings this up is because, um, I mean, you can, but the first thing you have to explain is why it's okay to treat electrons in metal like they are free electrons. But, um, <laughs> but so, so some of what I talk about now will be, uh, you will see some analogs of that here. Um, but I, like at the energy levels they will calculate. But I do think so, um, the emphasis that I will place will be different from your Textbook, yeah, especially get into this. So we're not gonna get into any of that. So, okay. So um, so without further ado, uh, let me talk about just uh, um, this uh, case of a three dimensional infinite square well. This is done as a kind of substitute replacement <laughs> for what was really in the uh, chapter eight topic proper. Um, so when you look at your textbook, and when you look at section 8.1, we do talk about the time independent Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. And we even give you this a form of a Schrodinger equation. And um, after having, uh, I don't know, brought up your expectation, you will see quite anticlimactically that we do nothing with it. <laughs> in the lecture, I don't do anything with it. And in the textbook, you will see, uh, yeah, we don't do anything with it. Like we somehow jump from here in Cartesian coordinates to way over here to this form of a solution in spherical coordinate. So I think, it, I mean, I'm not saying I would do it any differently, and I didn't do it any differently, but I think there's some aspect of that's not quite satisfying. So, um, we have a saying uh, that particularly applies in quantum mechanics. Uh, the saying that you will hear in different contexts is the, is the command, shut up and calculate. And <laughs> it, it's not just because it's not just the case of being physicists being rude. Um, it, it's a, a philosophical mindset actually, because um, it's particularly relevant in the case of quantum mechanics, although that's not the only case. Um, you, you can kind of see an aspect of that when you look at the classical mechanics and the um, shift from the Aristotelian physics the physics of Greek philosophers and the actual Newtonian mechanics. You know, in Aristotelian physics, there were a lot of philosophizing about nature of uh, stuff and whatever, and all of that just turned out to be wrong. <laughs> physics it doesn't begin its proper start until people are looking at quantitative things. People are look, uh, actually doing experiments, uh, measuring and calculating numbers that can be compared. And in quantum mechanics, especially uh, some aspects of quantum mechanics is very difficult. The philosophical aspects of quantum mechanics, uh, there are many unsettled questions even now. It kind of falls under what one might call, um, uh, what one might call uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics. And I think if there's time in about two weeks, I do want to talk about something called the EPR paradox and um, how that's an aspect of the difficulties of different uh, possible interpretation of, of quantum mechanics. So when you're trying to assign meanings to some aspects of things, there, there's a <laughs> um, difficulty there. Where there is no controversy and there is um, 
no doubt it, with anyone uh, where uh, physicists are very competent at doing is actually calculating and predicting results of experiments. So, so that's uh, why I say shut up and calculate. And um, so th that's uh, frankly what a lot of upper division quantum mechanics focuses on, um, on actually carrying out the calculations, uh, carrying out the results that can be compared to with experimental results. So, so what I want to do in the next uh, 20 minutes or so is actually just uh, doing a set of calculations for a situation that relates to this, but isn't going to be exactly this. Um, and it, uh, it's going to be a set of calculations that is similar to what you have seen, but it'll be different in some ways. And I'll be able to point out some of the significant distinctions. That's kind of what these keywords are. Let me just uh, look at it again to make sure that I, okay. Yeah, I <laughs> know what I'm gonna make sure I mention. So uh, I guess, uh, um, it, it, I think it's good for me to start by copying this uh, form of um, Schrodinger equation. Uh, we are not gonna use this exactly, but even so, I think it's a good starting place. So let me um, paste this into my notebook somewhere down here, and uh, we'll get started by writing out what the topic of this uh, 20 minute or so lecture will be. So I guess what I should call it is, sorry, I'm trying to get my pen in order. Okay, what I should call this is three dimensional particle in a box. So as a reminder, you know particle in a box. You have seen that before. Um, that uh, when you had this, uh, the 1D version looked like this, you have this box of a potential. Um, this was where potential was equal to zero. You had the potential go up to infinity at, uh, I don't know, let's say at x equals zero and at x equals L. Um, the, the potential is going all the way up to infinity, and you found um, and um, a lot of energy levels, and um, or you found a lot of wave functions and energy levels associated with them. And the Schrodinger equation, if you remember, that applied to this situation. I'm going to write down just the time-independent version, was uh, minus h bar squared over two m double position derivative, uh, x derivative of the wave function. Uh, it's time in the independent version, so I'm not gonna write down any uh, time dependence. And for the potential energy part, it, um, it had a zero. Uh, at least for the region from x equals zero to x equals L. And we made some arguments how outside of this region, wave function should be zero exactly. So the whole equation didn't matter. So uh, that's the potential part. And that's equal to for the stationary solutions or energy eigenstates, they should have an energy eigenvalue times the function itself. You could also write this in the operator form. Um, momentum in the X or <laughs> I'm going with momentum squared over 2n psi X is equal to energy, not an operator for this time independent Schrodinger equation uh, times the psi x. So this is what you have seen in chapter seven. And this uh, frankly was the only example of um, detailed working out of Schrodinger equation. If you look back uh, for any other scenario, <laughs> we didn't work it out in detail, even for simple harmonic oscillator, because it when, when this is no longer zero, it's actually very difficult to work this out in detail. So, um, so you know, in chapter eight, while we are dealing with the um, the atomic physics, we frankly didn't. Um, so this is the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom, and 
um, as you have seen in the textbook and you've seen me covering the lecture, this is actually fairly difficult. And uh, we're not going to work it out in detail or work it out in a shape or form. Um, we just have you do some simple calculations using the known solutions. So, you know, we are not going to deal with this um, equation exactly. Uh, and really what's causing difficulty um, in this uh, uh, three-dimensional Schrodinger equation for the electron in the hydrogen atom is really this term here, because this term contains this uh, uh, coordinate variable R that's uh, really not... Uh, it, it, it's a, a spherical coordinate system coordinate. And if you were to rewrite this as square root of x squared plus y squared plus g squared, then you can begin to see that, uh, oh, this is a really super complicated um, differential equation. So it's gonna take heavy machinery of um, you know, differential equation solving to solve it. So, so we are not gonna do that. What I will, what we, we what we will do, we will do a version of this that is much easier because what we will do is, okay, let's not do the Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom. Instead, we'll do a related one that's much easier. One where we can say, oh, my potential is equal to zero. That's what I mean, three-dimensional particle in a box. And uh, if it's just the uh, potential is equal to zero, then you know that would be um, that would be a free particle, and that's a whole kind of mass. So let me spell it out exactly what I mean. My potential is a function of x, y, and z. It's gonna be zero uh, when it satisfies a particular condition, and the condition is that my x is between zero and l x. Uh, let me keep that separate for now. And uh, let me put a constraint on my y variable between 0 and y. Oh, you know, I probably should get rid of this equality. Let's say it's uh, uh, because at the exact values of 0 and the boundary, it's kind of a uh, that's the kind of place that we physicists will like to hand wave and mathematicians will keep asking you about your discontinuities. I don't want to do that. Um, okay. <laughs> Finally, the condition on the G variable, G going from X to LT. And I'll worry about the boundary values later. So it's zero uh, within this uh, box, within, the, within this cube of a certain size. And outside of that box, let's say my potential goes to infinity, uh, to infinity otherwise. So this equation I have written down, it really applies only within this finite region. Uh, that'll make it easier for us to handle it. Uh, uh, kind of similar to 1D particle in a box. I hope uh, a lot of this begins to sound familiar. So, so that's our starting point, the three-dimensional Schrodinger equation for particle in a box. So our goal is, uh, let me rewrite this equation. Uh, so this is our um, starting Schrodinger equation for our particle in a box, uh, minus h bar squared over 2m. And I'm actually gonna do a little bit of a factorization that your textbook doesn't. Uh, I'm going to write down a sum of these differential operators. Uh, derivative with respect to uh, x, derivative with respect to y plus derivative with respect to z, all of them acting on some wave function as a function of x, y, and z is equal to uh, some scalar coefficient times the same wave function in, as a function of x, y, and z. And as I and only under this condition here, uh, outside because uh, the same argument applies. If the potential goes to infinity, then the only way you can make the um, 
wave functions come out right is to say um, for um, this equation that when it's not meeting these conditions, um, so I guess I would say zero equals zero uh, for other x, y, and z. Because so so I'm not worried about um, other values of x, and y, and z. Other than I guess I should specify that psi of x, y, z uh, is equal to zero in uh, in this other cases. So, so we are limiting ourselves to do this uh, to this box uh, of uh, I guess if I'm so this is the beginning to come to be a place where I can quite draw full drawings. Um, so I'll have to draw kind of a snapshot cross sections. So for one, uh, as for the spatial, um, as for the kind of spatial distribution. What you have is this, uh, let me uh, call this, sorry, I'm trying to draw my cube. Uh, how well have I drawn? Let me call this my origin. Then this point uh, along my x-axis is, this point is gonna be LX. This is gonna be LY along my y-axis and along my z-axis. This is gonna be my LZ. Oh, I called it a cube, but I guess technically it's a, is it a cuboid? Later on, um, when we get to the right part, I will eventually set these dimensions to be equal to each other. But uh, for now, uh, so this is uh, upcoming. For now, I'll keep them as a separate letter so that we have more flexibility as we go. Um, so yeah, that's a, uh, um, and so in this picture, I drew um, kind of a figure of the region within which we have an interesting wave function, as in our wave function is not guaranteed to be zero. And you can already see that we are running out of space here. Um, I've already used you know, one axis more than I have in drawing the region. So I don't have any access to indicate how my wave function looks like. So, so I think for this lecture, I will limit myself to drawing one dimensional projection of the wave function uh, so that I can actually sketch both of the, in, in my two dimensional screen, I can both sketch my, uh, the coordinate variable and the, the values of psi because, um, yeah, I already have one, two, three, four parameters I might sketch, so I have to pick two somehow. So I'll always pick it in terms of the, uh, the coordinate variable and then wave function value. So, so if you are staring at this and don't know quite uh, where you would go, um, you would be in good company. Because um, I think you might recall back to your solutions for one dimensional case. So you think, all right, maybe this is, um, maybe something like this might work. You say, okay, psi of n um, x, this was my set of my solutions to the one dimensional particle in a box. Uh, I think this was sign of, um, uh, I guess, let me write it out in full. Um, I guess it should be pi x over L sub x. So, so with this solution, I think the differential equation is satisfied or it, the one dimensional version. So for now, I'm kind of forgetting about this. So forgetting that for now, you take a two x derivatives, sine goes back into minus sine, minus is cancel. So you have h bar squared over two m times pi squared over lx squared. So as long as you can set, oh, let me undo that. As long as you can say that my values of my energy, um, oh, wait, wait, I forgot n here. It could be potentially n pi x. Uh, as long as my values of energy are um, n squared 
pi squared h bar squared over um, 2 m l x squared, then, um, then this was a lot of solution. So now, uh, if you are thinking of trying this out just to hear, huh, I think it might actually work. So um, it does, uh, if you are, so since this is a, a, a form of solution that you are familiar with, if you just to try this, I think it actually works out to some degree. Uh, oh, oh, wait, wait. Um, it seems to work out until it doesn't. So let me show you how it seems to work out and show you how it doesn't work out. <laughs> so, so let me just plug this in. If you plug this in here, this is what you see. You have uh, minus h bar squared over 2n. And I'm just going to replace these derivatives with what you get when you take the derivatives. Uh, you get uh, what I was describing earlier, minus, um, uh, let me reserve A until later. You get those two factors that you get from chain rule, m pi squared over Lx squared, and squared pi squared over Lx squared. And you get a times, I already wrote down the minus from, you know, derivative sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is minus sine. So sine of n pi x over Lx. Um, okay, that's my x term. And my y and z terms are super simple. This is a function that does not depend on y and z. These partial derivatives, they explicit instruction is for you to treat everything other than y and g as constant. So, um, so you know, this is zero. This is also zero. Um, okay, we are done with the left-hand side. So you write down the right-hand side, e times, um, let me just write out psi of x, y, g, uh, technically just only psi of x, but so a times sine of n pi x over lx. So you think, hey, this looks exactly like my one-dimensional case, that um, 1D case that I was looking at earlier. So it looks like uh, it's all going to work. So you say, my wave function solution is this. And um, if you wanted to, you can do something similar for the y direction. You say in the y direction, this is a sine of m pi y over l y. Um, for the g direction, you say a times sine of n pi g over l g, and as you are, and you say, oh, I'm all done. I found my three solutions, and I can put in any of these in here, or I can put linear combination of these here, and it'll all work out. As you are <laughs> as I'm saying that to myself, um, here's a reminder to always do this. You have to match boundary conditions. And what you will find is that for each one of these solutions, so one, two, and three, um, they can only match boundary conditions for one of the dimensions, the dimension that they have the variable for. I mean, that's how the one dimensional solution was built. So for this X dimension, the boundary conditions are matched. But for example, take this uh, Y dimension solution, for example, not only this needs to satisfy the boundary condition that at Y equals zero, and at y equals L of y, L sub y. Uh, so at these values, you need to have psi of y equal to zero. That is satisfied. That's one of the boundary conditions. But the other boundary condition is at x equals zero and at x equals L sub x, my psi of y has to be equal to zero and that cannot be satisfied. For example, take the point where x is equal to zero and y is equal to 
I don't know. Let me get the value of um, Ly over 2. Yeah, Ly over 2. Then this is sine of y, that's going to give you a 1 or minus 1, depending on, on what the, your value of n is, and um, or 0 in some places, depending on the value of n. Um, and uh, at this coordinate point, this is not guaranteed. So, um, so the these solutions that I was proposing, they don't match bound. They cannot be used to match boundary conditions. So you cannot propose any one of these individually as um, as a possible solution to this uh, three-dimensional Schrodinger equation for the particular scenario we are working on. So, so you might say, okay, we've seen this um, problem before and <laughs> one, well, where have you seen the problem? I guess I kind of alluded to it when we were doing the one-dimensional particle in a box. I did say something about how the free particle, uh, free wave solution that goes infinitely in both directions is not the, it's not physically possible solution, but um, you can kind of use them to build up your uh, physical solution. And so, so maybe you try something like this. Uh, okay, let me give them separate labels, X, Y, and Z. And you say, okay, so my wave function needs to depend on all x, y, and g. So my problem before was that, um, so my problem before in trying to match boundary conditions was that uh, my wave function depended only on one of the three coordinate variables. So you say, okay, I'm gonna use this to build up my, um, y, my uh, uh, combined wave function and say, oh wait, forgot the labels x, y, t here. And you build up something like this, a sub x sine of n pi x over lx plus a sub y sine of n pi y over ly plus a sub t sine of n pi t over lt. Now, if you are considering if uh, this might work, you'll find that it doesn't work. <laughs> um, because I, I think I can demonstrate this uh, really simply um, this way. Um, so when you have a boundary condition that says that, let's say t is equal to, to so at the values of t is equal to zero and L of zero, you need to have your total wave function equal to zero. This is a condition on only one of your three variables. So, I mean, you could do all you want to make this equal to zero, uh, that, that you can definitely do. Uh, in, in, in fact, it, this is built to exactly do that. But here's the problem. Um, what this boundary condition means, whenever this is met, for all values of x and y, this also needs to hold. And that doesn't happen because zero plus non-zero values here, that's non-zero. So this particular linear combination of wave functions won't give you what you're looking for, which is a total wave function that can actually meet these boundary conditions. So, um, so I guess that there are two different ways to get at the actual solution. Um, <laughs> how do I introduce in a minute or so? One is to say, uh, to kind of keep doing what we've been doing so far, which is just guessing and checking. Uh, you know, we don't have any experience with any of this. It's no shame to not get the correct answer <laughs> at first to try. So um, we tried the guessing plus that didn't work. Uh, 
we could guess times, we could guess that um, what if we multiply them? Will they will that work now? <laughs> we can do that. It'll turn out that it'll work. So that's one way to do it. Um, and I find that slightly um, unsatisfactory. So let me try to give you a little bit of a mathematical explanation why this way of combining solutions will actually give you an answer that'll work. As in, it satisfies the Schrodinger equation and uh, you can use it to match boundary conditions. I think being able to match boundary conditions, that's the easy part to see because, um, because once there are products, then once you can make, and given that my boundary condition really amounts to making psi of x, y, and z equal to zero as some correct uh, coordinate values, um, this product arrangement really makes it easy to make the wave function go to zero. If any one of these three factors are zero, then the whole thing is zero. So, so I think that part is really easy to see. Um, the part that might not be all that easy, <laughs> particularly because uh, most of the people in this class won't have experience dealing with a partial differential equation, is how come, how would this be a viable solution? to this uh, differential equation. I mean, I'm just uh, multiplying stuff together. And I think we are used to seeing linear combination of solutions being a solution, but this is not a linear combination. This is a product of solutions. It, you have no reason to expect, for example, this solution one times itself, that's not a solution. So, so I think that's the place where you need a little more justification why this particular combination of solution would be a solution. And this is what I am referring to in my keywords as separable solutions. So let me copy this over and illustrate what it's meant by separable solutions. All right, so separable solutions idea starts out with uh, this uh, supposition. Um, so it's not that you necessarily know what the form of the solution, uh, what the exact actual solution is, but um, not knowing the actual form of the solution, this uh, whole multivariable function, it, I know it's complicated without actually having attempted to write it down. So my sincerest hope is that I can write down this uh, multivariable function in a way that it can be separated uh, into uh, discrete chunks of single variable functions. And one way I'm hoping it might be able to be separated is one function in terms of one variable times another function in terms of another variable of the three times another function in terms of another variable. So, you know, I have three variable, a uh, multivariable function. What I'm supposing is, uh, suppose it is possible to uh, divvy up this solution in this way. Uh, let's see what happens to this equation. I'm going to, uh, let me just plug it in and just write down what happens. Um, so let's just write it down. <laughs> um, so uh, let me write it in, I guess I'll write it in green. Um, so I have minus h bar squared over 2m. So uh, uh, let me keep the order careful so that I, I can clearly see what's being differentiated and what's not. Um, so as this uh, differential operator is acting on the wave function, with respect to y and z, it's not going to do anything. So this is going to move right across the derivative operator. So I have basically scalar multiplication by these functions times the double position, der the double derivative with respect to x. Uh, be careful here that this is capital X, this is lowercase x. <laughs> Uh, let me keep going with it here. Um, it's uh, the other two functions, the function in terms of X and Z that moves through the derivative 
and I can treat that as different, uh, just a multiplication by scalar. And I have the double derivative with respect to lowercase y. Same deal with the last term. Um, the two functions that can just move right through the derivative operator and the double g derivative, double derivative with respect to lowercase g. So that's what I get when I apply this here. And that's equal to some scalar times of the whole wave function x, I guess, y times t. And you might look at this and um, think, hey, this doesn't look any simpler. <laughs> what am I doing with this? <laughs> um, let me do something uh, that I can do because uh, I used to have a quantum mechanics professor who used to say, because you can't stop me. Uh, because, you know, I'm doing a perfectly valid mathematical operation. Uh, you can't stop me from doing this. I'm going to multiply both the left and the right hand side by um, the wave function itself or one over x times y times g. Uh, the places where they go to zero, yeah, I'll deal with that. They, those are pointwise singularities. But for the most part, I can just do this. And let me write out the result of this operation. When you write out the result of this operation, this is what you get, minus h bar squared over 2n. For this first term, you see y and g cancel out. And I just have this x left. So I have a 1 over x times this uh, double derivative plus um, something very similar here happens. All but one of the functions cancel out. By the way, this is function. Uh, so the one over y is a function of y times um, double y derivative of capital Y plus the same deal with the third term, uh, one over the function g times the double g derivative of capital G with respect to lowercase g is equal to some number scalar e. And when you look at this, this is the argument that is made. The quantity on the right-hand side, this is constant. And that's actually quite remarkable because when you look at these three terms on the left-hand side, you have a function that's a function entirely of a single function. And if you have, a, if you look at the second term, that's again a function. I'm just making on the letters. Function of an entirely single function. When you look at this, this is again a function. Oh, what comes after theta? Oh, e theta. Oh, I, I don't know. Capital upside. Sorry, this is a very confusing letters. <laughs> this, don't don't focus on what letters I'm picking. I'm just I, what I'm trying to say is that this is a function of a single variable, function of a single variable, function of a single variable, and for these to each add up to a constant, really the only way this can possibly happen, if this is constant on its own, and this is constant on its own, and this is constant on its own. Because if that weren't the case, then you can imagine, um, you know, if two of them were constant and this last term wasn't constant on its own, then you can just imagine varying the parameter g and this whole thing would have to change. And the fact is it shouldn't, it can't. That's the constraint here. So what this is showing is that this individual, each dimensional term individually has to be constant on its own. So that allows you to basically separate out this uh, Schrodinger equation um, where, um, where this right-hand side, instead of this looking like a single scalar times the wave function, you can kind of look at this as, so you, you can go through the detailed algebra to justify this fully. Uh, what this is gonna look like is uh, the constant scalar that's associated with one of them here 
is sub x plus the constant scalar that's associated just to one of them here is sub y plus the constant scalar just that is just associated with one of them is sub g times the entire wave function again. So, so this is what we refer to as separable solution or rather specifically, this is the separable solution. And this is by no means no um, constraint that all the solutions to this wave function has to be separable. It, it might not be. This is one, of, one set of solutions that we can easily find with which you can build up any other more complex um, solutions. And the nice thing about the separable solutions is that each of these components of the solution is, it, it's, a, um, it's a solution to the one dimensional version of a Schrodinger equation, where we say this term is, this term is equal to E of X, this term is equal to E of Y, this term is equal to E of T. So this procedure allows us to separate out uh, of the three-dimensional Schrodinger equation. Uh, um, so solve it kind of piece by piece, each one dimensional piece at a time. And, and that's what you see up here. Um, when you go through this separable solution, what you see here is that uh, separated solution. So uh, this is the psi x, or yeah, yeah. Uh, or psi n x of x. This is um, psi n y of y, and this is psi n t of t. And uh, the normalization coefficient, there's no reason to have three of them. I can kind of combine them all into just one um, for the entire wave function. It, the, the whole wave function is normalized all together. They're not normalized to one dimension at a time. So I'll just uh, keep this as uh, A in the front. And so this, uh, um, this uh, wave function has three quantum numbers, uh, Nx, Ny, and Nt. And, um, and you can, Sorry, I'm way over time. Uh, you can see from here what the uh, allowed values for the total energy will be. You can kind of generalize from this one dimensional case and knowing from having done this uh, separable solution procedure that the total energy will be just some of the energies. Um, I, yeah, it will be some of the energies. So kind of taking the Q from the version, the solution for the one dimensional version, um, you can get something like, uh, so energy of the, the state that's uh, specified by the three quantum numbers, Nx, Ny, Nz is equal to um, the, 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 sum, <laughs> the sum of this with, uh, with a version of the x, y, and z. Let me just write it out. I'm going to factor out the part that can be factored out, pi squared h bar squared over 2m times, and this is the part that can be factored out, nx squared over lx squared plus ny squared over ly squared plus nz squared over lz squared. So, so that's it. That's a kind of the solution to the three-dimensional um, uh, particle in a box, uh, Schrodinger equation. And there are a lot of interesting things you can explore with this. Um, I guess we are way out of time. I still have to, <laughs> I still wanted the chapter 10 overview. So, uh, so I'll stop it here, except to just uh, spell out what can be explored further without actually getting into that um, in uh, explicit detail. One is the idea of um, uh, what you might call energy degeneracy. And you've actually seen that uh, with a hydrogen atom, um, 
So with the hydrogen atom, when you are looking at the gross structure, the pr principal quantum number gives you the energy level. And when you change the angular momentum quantum numbers or the magnetic quantum number, it doesn't give you a different energy. So you have a degenerous, uh, what we call degenerous in energy levels as in uh, distinct quantum mechanical states have the same energy. So given one energy, there are multiple um, wave functions that match to that energy. And the way this is written, you can't quite see that, but if you were to consider a special case where the box is a cube, then you can see that you do have that degeneracy. Uh, so, so for example, uh, one, sorry, two, one, one state has the same energy as one, two, one, and one, one, two state. So, uh, and those are three states characterized by three different quantum set of quantum numbers are different states, but they have the same energy. And this kind of degeneracy is something that that's uh, impossible to see in the one dimensional case. And you really need to deal with the two multiple dimension, two or three dimensions or higher to see that degeneracy in energy. So that's one. And the other I wanted to talk about, <laughs> what did I want to talk about? Uh, uncertainty principle and operator commutability. Um, what that amounts to is, uh, I, what I actually kind of used um, without pointing out explicitly. Um, so when I was working out this expression here, I kind of commuted these functions in terms of Y and G with this momentum operator for X. And, um, and same deal here with the momentum operator for Y. Same deal here with the momentum operator for Z. And um, so, you know, you have seen the uncertainty principle in this form, delta P times delta X uncertainty momentum and position is greater than or equal to H bar over two. And it turns out what's important here this is only for the uncertainty momentum in the X direction. So if you are for whatever reason, looking at uncertainty in the momentum of Y direction times the, the um, X position uncertainty, for example, that can actually equal zero. Um, there's no prohibition. And it, this amount, this uh, boils down to mathematically that the measurement operator for X, which is multiplication by X, it commutes with a multiple uh, measurement operator for the momentum in the Y component, which is proportional to the derivative with respect to Y. These two commute, they can swap the order without affecting anything. So, um, so there is no such uncertainty principle like this with respect to operators combinations like this. So, um, and that's also kind of something that we talk about more in upper division quantum mechanics. In lower division quantum mechanics, we don't have the necessary tools of linear algebra, um, the upper division level linear algebra. So, so we'll leave that there. So, so that's, uh, sorry, I went 25 minutes over what I had intended to take for this item. Um,